Hello, welcome. I'm Michael Bott. And I'm Rupert Suskin. Ever quick as ever. Uh, we are the prehistory guys. <laughs> yeah, the prehistory guys. Prehistory guys doing our best to keep it real in a world of um, ancient aliens and imaginary super civilizations, you know. <laughs> so true. Sad, but what true. What do you do? Yes. What do you do? Today, <laughs> we're talking about boats, old boats, um, very, very old uh, boats. Rupert, tell us, how do we come to be talking about very old boats today. Very old boats. Well, this is, it's an ongoing excavation, really. and It's a site that was found quite a while ago, and the excavations were done in the... Uh, I think they started around 2005. Um, and, Even before that, I think. Uh, Let's look. Yeah. Uh, uh, did they? Because I know they found it in 1989. But um, anyway, oh. the, the excavations... The, the thing is... This site is underwater. It's yeah. um, it's not too far from Rome, La Marmotta, uh, mm. the name of the site, and it's now underneath Lake uh, Bracciana. I think is uh, is Fair how enough. that's pronounced. And and the the site itself. Um, what's surprising about this uh, is that it's quite an extensive settlement where they've found these canoes. And uh, it's now 300 metres from the shore. So, uh, so you know, going back, th these date to uh, 5,000, the earliest date is 5,700 BC. So it's, mm. it's say, roughly 7,500 years ago. Uh, so clearly uh, the water levels were significantly lower. Yeah. And, uh, and I can't remember off the top of my head how far it is from, because this is upriver. Uh, yeah, isn't it? it uh, yeah, it's a few. Uh, it's a few side. kilometers. What? What? It's fifteen kilometers, something yeah. like that. Maybe, maybe longer. Something I don't know. Like uh, but the point that. is, got it's got uh, you know a navigable uh, waterway right to the, yeah. uh, the the coast there. I think yeah. the date is the important thing here because we probably wouldn't be quite so excited and and be delivering this if it weren't for the fact you know that this is an area that we've been looking into and we're mm. always uh, you know our antennae are out for anything that helps us solve the riddle about about early navigation in the Aegean Sea and uh, the Mediterranean. And um, this date, what's it? Five, it's uh, over five thousand BC. We're talking, so yeah, five thousand seven hundred to five thousand one fifty. Well, exactly. Are the dates that they've given. Know, so it's not too far after, you know, the farmers first started venturing out. You know, which was, mm. I mean, the first farmers arrived on Crete, for example, seven thousand BC, something like that. So you know, it, it helps to have something. Uh, you know that we can point to saying yes they were able to navigate the seas so that's where mm. this is helpful and it's interesting also the mainstream media don't seem to have picked up on this one it's it occurred more in in sort of it's uh, funny isn't it because Le Marmotta as a as a site uh, you know has been reported before I mean I think we first heard oh. about it uh, a, a few years ago certainly mm. but it's because they found these canoes uh, that uh, that it's mm. uh, that it's all come up again but yeah. as you say why is this not more widely reported it's very exciting well uh, talking of reporting um, I'm going to I've got an article from Live Science here. Um, mm. which is headlined 7,000-year-old canoes from Italy are the oldest found in the Mediterranean, which is slightly um, not quite true, but near the Mediterranean. Anyway, it says, uh, five canoes found at the bottom of a lake in Italy were used more than 7,000 years ago for fishing and transport by people living in a Neolithic village near what is now Rome. Archaeologists discovered the boats at La Mamotta, a prehistoric coastal settlement that is now underwater while constructing, conducting, I should say, ongoing excavations, according to a study published Wednesday, March the 20th, in the Journal of PLOS One. Actually, going back to that thing about ongoing excavations, the, the excavations must have been going on for a bit longer than uh, what you said, because... The study of the first canoe, the big canoe, uh, Mamata One, what they're calling it, was actually first undertaken in 1998. That the that the experiment, they did a you know experiment to prove its seaworthiness. I'm probably getting mm. ahead of ourselves, but you know, 
It's extraordinary, isn't it? You know, this has been going on at La Mamata for so long, and yet this paper has only just recently been published, uh, March the yes. 20th this year. So yes. the large dugout canoes, which were constructed of alder, oak, poplar, and European beech, were built between 5,700 and 5,100 BC, radiocarbon dating revealed. The boats are the oldest ever found in the Mediterranean, according to a statement. Uh, according to a statement, uh, one of the smallest boats was probably used for fishing. Study co-author Mario Menio, an archaeologist and director coordinator at the Museum of Civilization in Rome, told Live Science in an email. Now, the, here we go. The two largest measured almost 11 meters long by 1.2 meters wide that's 36 by 4 feet and it is probable that thanks to some easy access to the Tyrrhenian coast via the Arone river uh, they could have been used for further trade did you know that that was the name of the sea the sea between sardinia and the west coast of uh, italy the tyronian sea tyronian sea or Tyr is it is it tyronian or tyrrhenian I have always Tyr called it the Tyronian, but you may well be right. I Tyr don't know. Tomato, Tyrrhenian. tomato. <laughs> it reads as, as Tyrrhenian. I'll, I'll, I'll put the spelling up on the screen. You can make it your own minds. Anyway, <laughs> who knew that there was a, a, a Tyrrhenian Sea within the Mediterranean mm. Sea? Yeah. So the other artefacts at, found at La Motta sort of point to this thing of you know wider connections that mm. these people were having uh, and potential trade and uh, up and down the coastness, uh, you know, not least of which is the presence of obsidian, which we sort of seem to come back to time and time again. And mm. it's the obsidian thing that is the proof positive that they were not just sailing up and down rivers, but they were going backwards and forwards. You know, they were taken to the sea because the particular obsidian that they've got at Lama Mata is sourced from, can only be sourced from uh, a couple of island, islands which are further down the uh, uh, Italian coast and nearer to, to mm. Sicily. Um, Lipari and uh, Palmarola, I do believe, the islands of, are the sources of obsidian for that. So mm. that's the nice thing. You can sort of rest easy on knowing that aside from the indications and the way these boats have been constructed that they had the potential to go to sea, is that we know that they must have been going to sea. And this thing of looking for the absolute evidence of how people were going about um, on, on the sea is, is quite uh, is gold dust, I think, really for us. Anything mm -hmm. else you need to say before we, I just read a bit more? Uh, um, maybe just making the point about the scale of the settlement itself, which oh, also yeah, gives yeah. you an idea of uh, uh, you know how settled these people were, because that they uh, during the excavation they they uncovered three thousand four hundred piles supporting the uh, the dwelling structures. So they've mm. estimated um, uh, the the positions allow them to define a group of fourteen. Uh, rectangular buildings and you know with walls made of wattle and door but you know i mean this is a you know it's a massive old settlement here you know in in terms of a, an excavated area um mm. uh, and i think uh, yeah maybe it's an underreported site uh, and this is the first time you know that i you know really come, come across it i i'm likening it in a way to uh, must farm you know, which is a much yeah. more recent uh, development, and of course, it's Bronze Age. Um, you know, down uh, in Cambridgeshire, um, yeah. in England, um, you know, where you've got houses on stilts and all the rest of it, and their life ways preserved because of the anaerobic conditions, because whatever the, it was sunk into the mud and uh, down into yeah. uh, uh, the waters of the lake, etc. Et um, yeah, that kind of thing. So. You've uh, looked at the the paper in a bit more depth. It's it's not just the I mean, we, you know we we've used the word canoes and getting a sense of scale of these and how big they are. I mean, four foot wide for a dugout canoe is quite something. But it's the embellishments upon yeah. these vessels that really nail it as far as their further purpose. So, yes. what can you say about those, Rupert? 
Well, it's, uh, there are these T-shaped, T-shaped, it gives the wrong impression. That's how they describe them in the paper. Yeah, I think but that's basically, the profile, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. is the profile, yeah. Uh, uh, but these were on one side of the uh, of uh, one of the boats in particular. That uh, So these pieces, four pieces that were along the wall of the boat on one side and they had holes going through them. So the interpretation, understandably, is that that would have been for attaching at least ropes and possibly sails and uh, uh, for me, I just, I in my head, I can just see that this would be a good way of attaching outriggers because you think if you're taking a canoe, however big it is, if you're taking a canoe onto anything other than a lake, yeah. then stability is a major issue. So having mm. the fact they're all on one side really screams outrigger to me. That's going to stabilise a boat yeah. a hell of a lot. Outriggers but, and stabilizers um, like that are a bit overkill if you're just going out onto a lake or a river. That's yeah, what, that's the other you know, way round of, of, yeah. of putting it, I guess. Yeah. Um, it says the construction techniques and materials used indicate a sophisticated understanding of boat building and navigation. Senior study author Niccolo Mazzucco, a senior researcher in the Department of Civilizations and Forms of Knowledge at the University of Pisa in Italy, told Live Science. Uh, there is, yeah, as you say, researchers think the vessels may have been equipped with sails or outriggers, or parallel support floats. Um, mm. uh, yeah, that's a, the is. The, I mean, the T-shaped things—they look like um, r rigging bars. You know, like there yeah. are attachments with holes. You know, it, which rigging <laughs> says sails as yeah. well. You know, if you've got. got got rope um because i know that there's also there's an element that, that they've got reinforcements across the hull transverse reinforcement it seems but holes like that that's that speaks to rope and rope to me speaks of rigging which implies mm. sails so that's another uh, or alternatively whole another, another idea world. is that um is that it could have been for lashing more than one canoe together side by side which you know effectively you could even have a try you know a catamaran sort of effect but um uh, but that we certainly know that you know the polynesians from uh, uh, from cook's writings that the polynesians would uh, lash uh, canoes together to transport greater numbers of people so mm -hmm. it's a possibility it's another possibility yeah. so how many how many canoes have been found or or told um, La Marmotta, they've got five. Just the five, they yeah. found. Yeah. Just the five. Um, <laughs> yes, I know. I know. Um, I and thinking? the smallest of them is 5.4 metres long. Yeah. So when we say canoe, that's still a big canoe, isn't it? 5.4 metres, that's what, 16 yeah. feet? Mm -hmm. like um, yeah. Um, uh, and... Um, we're lucky in a way because we've we've stood next to you know something of a, a slightly smaller scale. There's a magnificent log boat canoe uh, in the uh, um, uh, Irish in the in the, muse in Dublin in the museum, museum in Dublin yeah. Dublin Museum, uh, which I think is Bronze Age. I, I can't remember right now that, but that must be about ten meters long, and it's just incredible to look at. You think how do they? Mm. Um, but I don't think that's anywhere near as sophisticated as these much earlier, it seems, seagoing and a craft. Uh, and uh, being able to declare that they are is um, uh, exciting. Um, yeah. No, I mean, th they did the experimental archaeology. They built a, they built a fashioned uh, rep rep replica and sailed it up and down the uh, Mediterranean. I think in the first test they sail it right across the Mediterranean up to Portugal. Which is, I mean, Did, rode or rode it or sailed it? I think a bit of both. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's exciting. Well, it is because you think I'd well, like to have been on that, <laughs> <laughs> or not. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> What's the worst that can happen? Yeah. Um, uh, Anyway, exciting stuff and exciting to us as a 
keep saying because of our Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge project, you know, where we're just pulling together, pulling together um, loads of stuff, articles, and we're making films, um, you know, that help tell the story about the, the, the spread of the Neolithic uh, across the Mediterranean and uh, Europe, up the Danube and up to uh, Stonehenge and uh, eventually. Mm. Um, so links down, have a look at the link down below um, if you think you uh, help support us uh, doing that. We're fundraising ongoingly to uh, to keep that going and, and keep making films about that. So have a look at the link mm. down below and, don't, and also while you're at it, there's a, a link to our Patreon site. Uh, and and mm. while I'm in this vein, don't forget to like and subscribe. That's it. Done yes, with that like bit. and subscribe. Definitely. <laughs> how do we how do we need to wrap up though? I think we've mentioned well, all the salient there's, there's points. Well, a, there's a few more details just to make the point. Oh, I'm really, because you mentioned getting ahead of um, myself. Uh, well, you mentioned the obsidian coming from Mediterranean islands. Yeah. Um, and the thing is that some of the other artefacts that they excavated at the site, uh, whilst not coming from other islands, uh, they did come from significant distances. So there were axes and adzes that came from the Alps, and uh, and there were flints that came from uh, sites elsewhere in Italy. Mm. Uh, so the, you know the point is that the distances uh, for uh, whether it's trading or whether it's you know gathering materials, they were travelling significant distances, mm. and um, and the other thing is that uh, bearing in mind they're excavating this site underwater, so the archaeologists are doing a phenomenal job here of extracting this information. But uh, uh, there's one paragraph, I'll just read you this. It says, plant and animal remains are indicative of a community with a fully consolidated domestic economy. Domestic livestock make up about 75% of the minimum number of individuals documented at La Marmotta. These consist mostly of sheep and goats, together with fewer cattle and pigs. The faunal assemblage also includes two canine species of different size and a wide variety of wild animals including mammals, and there was then a list of, yeah. of different animals. But the point is, it's a lot of animals here. Uh, you know, this this is a, you know, a bustling little place. It's all going on yeah. at La Momota. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, th yeah. this is the, the joy of finding these kinds of sites, lakeside or wherever, that have uh, left their deposits in water, that they are preserved. So goodness knows mm. how many other sites that are dotted all, all around that uh, haven't um, benefited from the same kind of preservation from our point of view. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it's just worth pointing out that, you know, at this period in time, this is not long after the first farmers have arrived in this part of the world. Because it took yeah. a, you know, a little while for them to get round Greece, round, round uh, uh, up Croatia and round uh, the Adriatic and, and and that and down around Sicily. So up the western coast was relatively late. So it's we're talking about maximum hundred you know, a few a couple of hundred years that farming has been established in this part and yet we've got these networks already going on. And I yeah. wonder, well, hang about how much of a a big change was it from the Mesolithic, you know, as we call it, and the Neolithic was it mm. you know was it an integration of the two i suspect that you know the the uh, farming spread along already established networks via the sea and 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 all the rest of it that were already ex yeah, pre existing in in, yeah. in the mesolithic but that's uh, um i think something to pursue a, another while and something we'll be pursuing you know as we spout out stuff from Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge so um yeah, no, good to pick up on the, those points. But I think with that, uh, our job here is done for the moment. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. folks, uh, thank you very much for watching, for, for listening uh, and for your support, uh, clicking like and subscribe and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for Take now. Take care, folks. See ya. Bye.